A scalar field is a function that associates a single number to every point in space. Here we refer to physical three-dimensional space, represented by the Cartesian coordinates x, y, and z. The temperature map of the world is an everyday example of a scalar field. Another classic example would be the altitude or height of a terrain. For a continuous scalar field, we can also define its gradient. The gradient is a vector field with a magnitude that quantifies the total amount of change of a field per unit change in distance for all orthogonal directions. At every point in space, it points along the direction of the maximum change. Thus, it is a vector field and is also known as the gradient field. The purpose of this video is to explain why the curl of gradient field is zero and what this means physically and intuitively. Gradient field emanates from sinks and sources. Let's consider a 2D scalar field for the elevation of a terrain. We show here the contour lines for the different elevation. The gradient field points along the direction of greatest ascent. If one go along the direction indicated by the gradient field, one would be led to a higher elevation. This continues until we reach the local maximum. The key intuition I would like to drive across here is that these local stationary points are sinks and sources for the gradient field from which the gradient fields emanates from and converges to. Let's consider some concrete examples, the simplest of which is a scalar field described by a Gaussian function. Its gradient field can be easily obtained. The color map shows the scalar field where the blue and yellow indicates low and high elevation, respectively. Here the vector map depicts the gradient field. To better depict the regions of source or sink, we just have to plot the divergence of the gradient field, or the Laplacian of the scalar field F. This quantity is also a scalar field and is given by this color map. The blue color indicates we have a sink, as evident from the convergence of the gradient field. On the other hand, if we flip the sign of the scalar function f to describe a valley instead, its Laplacian yields a source for the gradient field as indicated by the red color. Next, let's consider another scalar field, which describe a ridge. Again, the gradient field are pointing towards the ridge. The Laplacian of F indeed confirms that the extended ridge is a sink for the gradient field. As you might expect, if there are no stationary points, there will be no gradient field. A flatland would be an obvious example of this. Clearly, its divergence would also have to be zero. It is a sinkless and sourceless, or divergence-less place. Let's conclude with a scalar field with a saddle point. Here the surface curves upward in one direction and downward in another, with the saddle point located in the center of the plot. The gradient field is not zero in this case, which is obvious since the slope is not zero. However, when we inspect its divergence, it is zero. Thus, the saddle point is also a divergentless place. The gradient field is being sourced and sink from outside this region. More about this next. So we have provided several illustrations of scalar field, its gradient field, and accompanying divergence. The latter, which is also the Laplacian of the scalar field, tells us the regions of source or sink where the gradient field emanates. Without loss of generality, we have included a minus sign in our definition of the gradient field. This then allows us to make direct analogy to electrostatics, where the electric potential is the scalar field and the electric field is the gradient field. In this case, the divergence of the electric field would then yield us the charge density. In other words, the source and sinks in our gradient field is analogous to the positive and negative charges in electrostatics. This equation, where the Laplacian of the electric potential equals the charge density, is also known as the Poisson equation. We shall dwell on this equation in the next few slides. Our first step is to try obtaining an expression for the electric potential V from the Poisson equation. We can do this with the help of the Green's function. 
The Green's function for the Laplacian is a well-known mathematical result and is given here. The electric potential can then be expressed using the Green's function in terms of the charge density as shown. The electric field, which is the gradient of the electric potential, can also be obtained directly. Now we are almost ready to prove that the curl of electric field is zero. It is much easier for our derivation if we express the continuous integral as discrete sum of point charges. We see that the electric field can be viewed as a superposition of electric fields from discrete point charges. For each point charge, the electric field is purely radial, a crucial point for our discussion. Now, we are ready to take the curl of the electric field. For the curl to be zero, the curl of the radial vectorial quantity as shown must be zero. Let's check. We can rewrite this quantity in a more compact form as shown. This is just the radial field, whose magnitude decays as 1 over radial distance square. The mathematical identity for taking curl of a general vector in spherical coordinate is given as follows. Substituting in all the vectorial components into the expression, we can indeed see that the curl is zero. This is obvious, because a radial field is clearly irrotational. Since the electric field is a superposition of radial fields emanating from the individual point charges, the net curl must be zero. Then by analogy, a general gradient field, which has exact mathematical mapping to the electric field, must also have zero curl. Thus, we have shown why the curl of gradient field must be zero. It turns out that there is another perspective that arrives at the same result. Namely, that gradient fields are conservative fields. Consider again our 2D scalar field. Consider going up the hill by taking the red path from A to B. Or one can also take the blue path. Both paths start at A and end at B. Since F is the elevation, it is obvious that the change in elevation FB minus FA is path independent. More intuitively, instead of elevation one can equivalently consider the potential energy V. This amounts to saying that the change in potential energy only depends on the starting and ending point. If the scalar field is the potential energy V, then the force is given by the gradient of V. The work done is then given by the integral of the force along the path of displacement. By conservation of energy, the work done must equals the change in potential energy. Let's look at the last equality. It is basically saying that the line integral of a gradient field is path independent. In other words, it only cares about the starting and ending points. Fields that possess such property, such as the gradient field, is called a conservative field. We see why it is called this way. The result from previous slide can also be derived mathematically, a result known as the fundamental theorem of line integral. We begin with the difference of the scalar field at points A and B, which can be written as the integral of a total derivative, where the position vector is parameterized by S. Using the chain rule allows us to rewrite this derivative in terms of the components of the gradient field. Finally, we can express it as a line integral of the gradient field, irrespective of the path taken between A and B. This is the same result we obtained previously from energy conservation arguments. Here we show the mathematical result that the line integral of a gradient field is always path independent. By extension, if the path is a closed loop, or in other words, A equals to B, then the line integral of the gradient field must be zero. This is the reason why it is called a conservative field. The line integral over a closed path is conserved to be zero. By the Stokes theorem, this also implies that the curl of the gradient field integrated over the closed surface must be zero.
Since this holds for any closed surface, this implies that the curl of the gradient field must be uniquely zero at every point in space. To paraphrase, the gradient field must be irrotational. Conversely, a vector field that has zero curl is a conservative field and can be expressed as a gradient field of some scalar function. This is an important result which finds useful application in electromagnetism. Please check out these videos on the Gauss and Stokes theorems if you need a refresher on these topics. You can find them in the electromagnetism playlist. Lastly, to mathematically prove that the curl of gradient field is zero is very easy. Let's go over the standard and very straightforward mathematical proof, albeit not as intuitive. We write down the gradient field of the scalar field F. The curl of the gradient field can be expressed in determinate form as follows, which we can work out explicitly. Inspecting the x component of the curl, we see that it is given by the partial differentiation of f with respect to the independent variables y and z. Since the order of the differentiation is irrelevant, the x component should be zero. The same argument also applies to the y and z components of the curl. Thus, the curl of the gradient field is exactly zero. Mathematically, this is a very straightforward result and probably deceptively simple. However, the physical meanings and implications of this result cannot be overstated, as elaborated in the previous chapters. I hope this video provides you the physical intuition to understanding why the gradient field is conservative and emanates from sinks and sources. Thus, it must have a zero curl.